Hello and welcome everyone. I'm really excited about today's workshop, all about how to read lead sheets and chord charts. Now this is going to be especially applicable to those of you in more contemporary church settings, but I think you'll find that the skills used to play lead sheets and chord charts are skills that we can all use. These are just basic musicianship skills for the most part. So even if you're not in a situation right now where you need to play from lead sheets, on a regular basis, I think you'll find the skills useful in the work that you do. Um, everything from harmonizing to composing to playing more by ear, um, developing flexibility, and lots more. And before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to take just a minute to explain the level of today's workshop so you know where I'm headed. This workshop is designed for those of you in church settings, um, either working as pianists or organists or accompanists, um, those of you who can read music and have some basic understanding of chords and how they're put together. I'm considering this sort of a graduate level workshop in that we'll go into some theory work and it'll be helpful, I think, if you had some undergraduate music theory classes or at least have a working knowledge of music theory at that level so that we can build on that together. Sound good? Okay, let's go over some of the basics. Part one today is all about chords. Now there are a few different types of chords that you'll see when reading and playing lead sheets and chord charts. So I wanted to take a minute to give you a quick refresher on those high school and college level theory classes um, and go over what those chords are and what they look like, just so we're all on the same page. Here is an example of a major chord. Now a major chord is made up of three notes. Um, you have the root, a major third above that, or four half steps if you're counting both the black and the white keys, and then a minor third above that, three more half steps, which becomes the fifth of the chord. So this is the C major chord. So I'm playing C, E, and G, the root, the third, and the fifth. Now very similarly, a minor chord is also a root, a third, and a fifth, but you'll notice that that third is one half step lower than in our major chord. So this is um, a minor third first from the C up to the E flat, and then a major third from E flat to G. That pattern forms a minor chord starting on any note. So this is a C minor. C is the root of that chord. Um, and you'll notice that the root and the fifth are the same um, whether the chord is major or minor, it's just that third that changes. The seventh chord, um, we add a minor seventh above the root. So we actually have four notes in the seven chord. Um, this is a, an example of a C7 chord. That's how it would be written on a lead sheet or a chord chart. Um, it has the notes of the C major chord, which again is C, E, and G. Those are the first three notes you see there. And then the B flat on the top is that seventh. An augmented chord, though less common, um, you will see this on lead sheets and chord charts too sometimes. Augmented means to raise the fifth by a half step, which ultimately creates two major thirds that are stacked on top of each other. So here is an example of a C augmented chord, and you'll notice hopefully how similar it is to the C major chord. Um, it's just that fifth is one step higher, so this chord is spelled C, E, G sharp. Similarly, a diminished chord uh, means to create two minor thirds stacked on top of each other. So this is very similar to a C minor chord. This is a C diminished chord that's shown. So very similar to the C minor chord, except the fifth is one half step lower. So it would be spelled C, E flat, G flat. Now chord symbols are those letters and numbers that you see above the staff or above the lyrics on a chord chart. Um, and we'll talk more about lead sheets and chord charts in just a minute. Um, first, let's talk about chord symbols. Um, chord symbols basically tell us what kinds of chords to play. So let me walk you through this. The capital letter of a chord symbol tells us the root of the chord, and then the number afterward tells us about other notes to add in. So for instance, this D7 chord. The D would tell us to play a D major chord, D, F sharp, A. 
the 7 tells us to add a minor 7th above the root of that chord, which in this case would be C. So the D7 chord would be spelled D, F sharp, A, C. Now in jazz music, you might see numbers like 9 or 11 or 13, indicating that you'd add the 9th, the 11th, or the 13th note above the root of the chord um, to add richness and color to that chord. Now that 4-3 that you see there next to the A means to play that chord with a suspension. So the way we do this is we play the fourth note above the root first instead of the third, and then resolve down to the third partway through playing the chord. So we would start in this case with A, D, E, and then resolve to A, C sharp, E. So we get that nice resolution. If you see a lowercase m after the capital letter, that means to play the minor version of that chord. So the m here would mean to play a B minor chord, B, D, F sharp. If the chord symbol has a slash in it, this tells us to play a specific inversion of the chord. Now inversion is simply a way of respelling the notes of the chord, right? So in this case, um, this G chord, the slash B indicates that B should be the lowest note, meaning we'd spell it B, D, G, a G chord in first inversion. The notes of the chord stay in the same order, we just start on B and then build up from there. So G is still the root of the chord, but B is the lowest note. You'll also see flat and sharp signs in chord symbols. Um, you'll see plus signs and degree signs like shown here, um, indicating either an augmented chord or a diminished chord, respectively. Now, those two particular chords may also be abbreviated um, A-U-G, AUG, or D-I-M, DIM, for augmented or diminished. Time for some practice. Here are a few chord progressions that are written out in chord symbols. Can you translate them? Can you play them on the piano? Try playing one hand at a time or playing the chord in your right hand and the root or the bass note if there's a slash in the chord symbol with your left hand. Now that we've talked about chords and chord symbols, it's time to talk about context. What is the difference between a lead sheet and a chord chart anyway? Well, a lead sheet has the melody line notated on the staff with chord symbols written above. A chord chart, in contrast, has chord symbols and lyrics most of the time, but no music notation. Here's an example of what a lead sheet looks like. Um, it may be used for solo playing or to accompany an ensemble or to support congregational singing. Um, when reading from a lead sheet, you'll most often play the melody, mostly with your right hand pinky, and then fill in the rest of the chord tones um, with your remaining right hand fingers, and then reserve the bass line for your left hand, using the chord symbols to guide you. Now, a chord chart, in comparison, is often just used for accompaniment. You can see how sparse it is. There is no clef and no time signature or key signature even. Um, there is no, um, no staff lines here. You have no idea what the melody sounds like. If you don't know this piece, all you have is the chords. Um, so this is a perfect example of how you could create an accompaniment for a piece where you don't actually have the melody written out for you. Um, either as part of a praise band or in a situation when a soloist or instrumentalist is playing the melody and you don't have to worry about it. So as such, you're really just playing, um, reading those chord symbols and keeping track of the chord progression or when the chords change. Now that you know a little bit more about how to read lead sheets and chord charts, it's time to talk about style. There are two main style approaches to playing lead sheets or chord charts. The first is keyboard style. In keyboard style, the chords and the melody, if you're reading uh, from a lead sheet, are in your right hand, um, played in the middle register of the piano, usually around middle C or so. And then the bass line is in your left hand, either a single note um, or octaves. If you're playing the melody as part of your accompaniment, 
Uh, make sure that that melody note is on top always. It's the highest note that you hear within the rest of the chord uh, below. An alternative to keyboard style is something jazz musicians like to call trio style. You know, in trio style, the chords are often played with your left hand, but in the middle register still. And then the melody or other melodic material, maybe that you're improvising um, based on the chords symbols, um, is it up in your right hand in a higher register. Now, if you're playing with a band and you have a bass player who's playing the bass line, trio style is a great choice because it allows you to fill in the texture, um, provide some harmonic support without crowding the bass line or duplicating um, what your bass player might be doing, and without getting in the way of the melody still. Ultimately, we want to keep the chords in the middle register of the piano where they can be heard clearly without sounding muddy or too dense. Make sure you keep that in mind. Once you know the basics, uh, there are lots of things that you can do to vary the chords that are written on the page to create a more cohesive keyboard accompaniment. Here are a few ideas to help get you started. First is blocked chords. Now blocked chord by definition is just playing all the notes of the chord blocked together, um, all at the same time. You could do this either um, once at the chord changes and then held throughout the measure, or you could pulse with the beat or use some sort of rhythm um, based on the character of the piece that you're playing and what else is going on musically. Now for a rhythmic variation, um, you might pulse the beat or play a simple repeated rhythm pattern just on the bass line note throughout. If you're not playing the melody and you're just playing chords in your right hand, you might play around with um, doing some rhythmic variation in your right hand chords as well. Again, dependent on the style of the piece and what else is going on so that you're not getting in each other's way. Broken chords is another um, option for variation. So in contrast to a blocked chord where you're playing all the notes of the chord at the same time, a broken chord is playing the notes of the chord one at a time. So you might explore um, playing some arpeggios between your two hands, playing the notes um, of the chord in keyboard order from bottom to top, either going up and then up or down, um, playing around with that. Or you could use broken chord patterns like or something like that. Inversions, um, again, respelling the notes of the chord, um, putting different notes on the bottom of the chord or different notes on top of the chord changes the character of the sound and maybe the direction that you go from that chord to the next. Um, so play around with different chord inversions in your right hand especially. Um, if you're not playing the melody, you have a lot of freedom and flexibility here. Aim for smooth voice leading. Try to find the closest inversion from chord to chord so you're avoiding a lot of jumping around. And if it's not necessarily outlined for you or specified um, on the lead sheet or chord chart that you're playing from, you might even try playing different inversions on different beats um, of the measure um, and using different octaves for added effect, especially if your um, piece has any repeated sections in it. Uh, finding a way to vary them when that musical material comes back again in the future. And finally, uh, varying the bass line. Try modifying the bass line so that you're not playing only the roots of the chords. Um, you might try adding your own slashes to the chords, coming up with different inversions, trying them out, seeing what you like. Um, you might try a descending bass line where the, the left hand moves down by step or by half step. Um, and see how that fits with the chords that you have in your right hand. Ready for some practice? I made you a sample lead sheet that you can use to get started um, developing your chord playing skills. So I suggest playing through the melody first, then practicing the chords um, separately. You might try playing it in keyboard style with the melody and chords in your right hand and the bass line in your left hand. Well, there you have it. Hope you've enjoyed this keyword skills workshop and that you walk away today with a better understanding of chords and chord symbols and how to continue developing these skills on your own. If you're looking for more training resources like this, I have some exciting news to share with you. I am thrilled 
to introduce my newest online course called the Church Musician Primer. It's a four-week online keyboard skills class specifically for church musicians. It's tailored to uh, music directors and keyboardists and organists in church settings. Um, this course will help you develop valuable sight reading and score reading skills, harmonizing skills. Um, it'll equip you to play and accompany hymns and anthems and contemporary songs, both creatively and confidently. And you'll hopefully gain the tools and resources you need to lead and support choral and congregational singing in a variety of worship settings. Here's a look at what's included in the course. You will get four 30-minute instructional video lessons released over the course of four weeks. Um, you'll have lifetime access to the course videos and materials. Um, you'll also get a comprehensive workbook with lots of charts and musical examples and practicing notes and things like that. You'll get weekly emails from me with class notes, um, assignments, and some action steps for you to take. And as a bonus, um, you'll get access to an online community with fellow church musicians, um, a place to network, ask questions, and share ideas and resources. This course is geared toward those with some playing and or company experience and a basic knowledge of music theory. Like today's workshop, um, I consider this to be a graduate level course that builds on the playing, reading, and musicianship skills that you either developed in undergraduate work um, or through experience in the field, um, and then theoretical knowledge gained from college level music theory courses. We'll build on all of that. We'll start the course by talking about um, some choral accompanying basics, things like playing warm ups, uh, reading open score providing support for singing slash knowing when to drop out. Uh, and then we'll take a look at what it's like to accompany in worship, special considerations for that. Um, things like learning how to cadence, uh, playing for communion, playing traveling music for certain parts of the service. In module two, we'll explore creative hymn playing and creativity in worship, including um, playing introductions, learning how and when to breathe for cues, providing support for con congregational singing, and creating your own harmonizations, modulations, and transitions on a regular basis. In Module 3, we'll talk mostly about contemporary music and contemporary worship um, with topics like playing chords, how to read lead sheets and chord charts like we talked about today, how to harmonize a melody, um, creating a sense of flow in your worship services, um, considerations for playing with a band, um, how to underscore prayers and readings and other parts of the service, and then how to introduce um, a new song or teach a new hymn to your congregation. And like today's uh, workshop, um, it will be sort of focused on contemporary music and contemporary worship settings, but I think that the skills you'll find um, are applicable even if you're not currently in a contemporary setting. I think these are skills that are worth developing um, that you can still use in traditional settings as well. And then the final module of the course will be devoted to planning and preparing for worship. Things like choosing service music and choral music, transition music, uh, preparing for rehearsals, um, practicing tips, um, how to prepare to play for worship, what to include in the bulletin, all sorts of things like that. This course uh, will begin on August 10th and run through August 31st, but there is a self-paced option available as well if the timing doesn't work for you. Remember, you'll have lifetime access to the course, so you can always go back and get a refresher if needed. No need to feel like you have to start the course on August 10th and then finish it in four weeks, um, but that option is available to you if you want the accountability. Either way, uh, registration will close on August 8th, so make sure to save your seat. Space is very limited. The course is currently on sale for $99, but the price will go back up on August 1st for that last week of registration. I would love to have you join me. Um, visit ashleydanu.com store for more details, and please let me know if you have any questions. I am happy to answer them. Thanks again for tuning in today, guys. Hope you have a great day.